Hey y'all, it's Andrew with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans. Today I want to introduce you to one of my colleagues who gives tours in a whole different part of y'all country, Charleston, South Carolina. This is a city where Free Tours by Foot also gives in-person tours. Diana's one of our guides over there. And if you're a traveler of the Southeast, you'll have heard comparisons between Charleston and New Orleans before. There's a lot of visual atmosphere in common, some foundations of shared history, but a whole lot of separate story over there, which I learned a ton about watching this video and had a great time doing it. So without further ado, I hand you off to the expert. Here's Diana. There are all these stones on the sidewalk. Some are not as elaborate as this one. Some is just a block of stone. Well, it's a carriage stone. Hi everyone, I'm Diana and welcome to Charleston, South Carolina. I am a licensed certified tour guide and a member of the Palmetto Guild here in the city. And we're standing here in Waterfront Park in front of our beautiful pineapple fountain. The pineapple is a symbol of hospitality it's used all over in our city. You can find pineapples in lots of different places. So when you're here visiting, uh, go on our, your own little scavenger hunt. You'll find them in finials of gates and all different little hidden places. Uh, but it is a symbol of hospitality. People were always welcome here, which is something a lot of people don't really think of. They think of an old Southern city. They think of a very provincial thinking. But in fact, it was a pretty cosmopolitan place from the very beginning. And going back to the very beginning, how old is it? We are a really old city for America. We were actually founded in 1670. And back in 1670, the land that was known as Carolina was humongous. It went from the northern part of Florida, north towards the North Carolina-Virginia border, and it technically had no western boundary. So it really went all the way out to the Pacific Ocean had they known it was all there. And it was named for King Charles II of England. He gets to the throne, uh, through a lot of turmoil in England, uh, but he gets there with the help of staunch supporters. And he realizes he really needs to thank these people. So he then gives his land called Carolina to eight men. He proclaims them to be the Lord's proprietors over Carolina. So although we sometimes say we were a colony, we were in fact a proprietorship. It's just a lot easier to say colony, so we can tend to do that. But one of those Lord's proprietors was Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper. He was the Lord of Shaftesbury. And he, along with John Locke, actually wrote some of the first governance papers for how this town should be set up with some of the most religious freedoms ever seen in the world before and to make it a welcoming place for everyone. So the pineapples really are uh, a symbol of hospitality uh, now and they have been forever. And it's a great symbol for our city. Waterfront Park that we've been walking through is not historic. Uh, this was actually dedicated in the 1990s, but it is a wonderful place to get a look at all of our waterways, which actually were a big reason why we ended up settling here on the peninsula. The first settlers came here in 1670, but in fact they did not settle on the peninsula of Charleston where most people come to visit today. They actually settled six miles up the Ashley River. Our two main rivers, the Ashley and the Cooper, are named after Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper. This river right here fronting the park is actually the Cooper River. As you look out, you'll see sort of a, a dike out there and a little island. That's actually Fort Sumter. We'll talk about that later on, as well as the Atlantic Ocean just beyond it. But to the right of it is actually where the Ashley River is coming in. So this is our inner harbor. It played a lot, a big role in our history. Part of our history actually is that we were a walled city and we were surrounded by water. Clearly the main part of the city was uh, fronted by these rivers. And next we're going to head to a spot that you might not think was water, but it really was. So let's uh, head over there. It's an iconic spot in the city of Charleston. So oh, here we are at another iconic place in Charleston. This is our city market. I told you it was once water because it was. Uh, it is now a city market. It's actually been open in the early 1800s. However, the land for this was donated in 1791 by the Pinckney family. And back then it was a tidal creek. But they donated their tidal creek for it to become a market for the citizens of Charleston. It took a little time to fill in the land and build the buildings. All of these buildings date to somewhere in the 1800s. And the market itself opened in the early 1800s and has been open every day since. 
The only day of the year that they close is Christmas Day, uh, but generally it's open all the time. Back in the 1800s, it was a farmer's market. We are right near the fresh water, so of course we had seafood, there was produce, as well as meats being sold here. Today you'll find local artisans and craftsmen selling their wares in here, and it's a great place to come and get a souvenir of the city of Charleston, as well as maybe some home decor. A lot of locals shop here as well. Uh, but again, all the buildings date to somewhere in the 1800s, and in the 1800s, at any given moment in this market, the majority population that you could find in there happened to have been African or African American. And because of that, in that time period, the market ended up with a nickname that unfortunately has stuck. Uh, you'll often hear it called the slave market. Please note that there were never, ever, ever slaves sold in the market. If that were to have happened, the Pinckney family actually would have taken the land right back. It just got that nickname because both free blacks as well as uh, slaves were selling goods in the market, house servants were coming to the market, so at any given moment there was just a large population of African and African Americans in the market in the 1800s. But we're going to keep walking through it a little bit and so you can get an idea of what you might find inside. Follow me. we've come out of the market, which is on Market Street, and we're heading on to Church Street. You'll soon see why it's called Church Street. There's actually three churches on Church Street. If anything, our founding members were pretty pragmatic about how they named streets. The market is on Market Street. There are churches on Church Street. The meeting house was on Meeting Street. Our widest street is Broad Street. And what we call East Bay Street today was just known as Bay Street back then. Uh, so they really didn't think too, too hard. However, that being said, they did lay their city out in a grid system, and that was thanks to John Locke and the Earl of Shaftesbury, Lord Anthony Ashley Cooper, who helped create the grand model for our home, uh, home city. They wanted streets laid out in a grid system with numbered lots. They even stated how wide the streets should be. Uh, so it was very, very well thought out from the very beginning. Uh, as far as why we became a walled city, the original settlers settled six miles up the Ashley River at a place you can tour today called Charlestown Landing, and I implore you to do so. They realized, however, that they were at the mercy of a lot of invaders, and they couldn't really see where anyone was coming from. A uh, friendly uh, Indian tribe suggested that they move here to the peninsula, which was known as White Point, thanks to all the oyster shells that could be seen at low tide, splashing all these little white uh, flecks in the sun. They said that they should move to White Point. If they did, they would have the view from both rivers and they would be able to defend themselves better, which made a lot of sense to the British. There was also always a breeze coming through, which it gets pretty muggy and humid and buggy here in the South. And people were dying of malaria and other insect-borne diseases, so the idea of a breeze sounded really nice as well. They also learned that the Cooper River is actually deeper than the Ashley River. And so they could make more money trading by being able to get further inland and up the coast. So in 1680, they formally moved over here and started making, uh, they'd already established part of the walled city, but they started making the walled city. Where we're walking now is approximately where the northern boundary of the wall was. And we're gonna come to a really cool little building that often is overlooked. And I implore you to please go and visit it. Uh, it is a museum. It's an interesting place. The people that work here are historians in their own right. Many have written books on the history of Charleston, and there's a nominal fee to go in, and I think you should. But it's this little building coming up here, uh, and it doesn't look like much. But this is the Powder Magazine. It's the oldest public building in the city of Charleston. It dates to around 1712, 1713. And along our wall, we had fortified bastions where we could store ammunition to be able to defend ourselves in, uh, in case of any possible invaders. And this is the last powder magazine still standing in the city. It is original to the city. The walls are three feet thick. The roof is designed like that with all of those peaks to it. So that if there ever were an explosion, it hopefully just would have gone up instead of out. There are a lot of wooden structures in our city and fires were always a huge concern. 
On top of that, we've discovered that there's actually sand underneath those tiles to help deaden a blow. How cool is that? And for a nominal fee, you can go in and check it out for yourself. Again, really cool place to go and visit. But uh, we're gonna go towards those church bells you may have just heard. We're gonna talk about a church over here. It's a really pretty view as we're walking of the church steeple itself, if you wanna take a look at it. It's a beautiful big uh, steeple. It's a nice view of it. This is St. Philip's Church, uh, and it is really impressive. Uh, St. Philip's Congregation is actually the oldest congregation in the city of Charleston. They established themselves in 1680. In 1680, their building was not located here just off the market. It was actually at a different spot that we'll be in later. Uh, but by 1710, they started to move over here and it took them about 12 and a half years to build a structure that looked exactly like the one you see here today. Uh, it was the first building on this side of the Atlantic to be of a classic style with Doric columns and a big portico as we come up, you'll be able to see it. Uh, and so it was completed around 1723. And in 1796, we had a very large fire here. However, the church was saved. And that was all due to a man who climbed up and started tearing off burning roof shingles and he saved the church from burning down. That was pretty remarkable. And the congregation was extremely grateful and floored by his bravery. And as a result, they took up collections for him. They collected just over $200 and they bought that man his freedom. We don't really know anything about him other than his name is Will. That's what the name that he went by. Uh, he was a boatman by trade. Uh, he was an enslaved man. He had nothing to do with the church, but upon his own volition, he saved it. So in 1796, the church remained standing and it remained standing all the way until 1835. Then we had another great fire. Charleston has suffered at least five great fires where at least 100 buildings or more are destroyed. In 1835, the building did burn down, but they started to rebuild. And this time it only took them around two and a half years or so to finish. By 1838, what you see was completed. And it is a replica of the original church. It's very rarely open to the public, but sometimes you are able to go in. What is really neat are these big wooden doors. In front of them are some iron gates. And those were actually the chancel gates of the original church. So one of the few uh, wrought iron pieces here in the city that are actually from prior uh, to the war. So that's pretty cool considering that most ammunition uh, was made out of the ironwork here in the city. Uh, the city was looted, so that is pretty awesome. We have a lot of beautiful ironwork here in the city. These gates are especially beautiful and really important to Charleston history, and they're often overlooked. These are actually from prior to the American Revolution. These are from the 1700s. They are one of only two examples left in the city of ironwork that is that old. Uh, so pretty cool. They uh, allow you to enter into the St. Philip's Cemetery. This side of the street is their cemetery. This side over there is their churchyard. Uh, you'll find graves on either side of the street. Uh, buried over on the churchyard side is Edward Rutledge, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And over here, uh, are a few important people too, as well as DuBose Hayward. He wrote Porgy and Bess, America's first operetta. Uh, so pretty important things happened along here. As we're coming up, we're gonna find another church. We are known as the Holy City. And in the beginning of this tour, I told you how a lot of religious freedoms were allowed here. And that is definitely true. We are now walking in is what is known as the French Quarter. A lot of French came here very early on especially French Protestants. So if you take a look, there's a pink church right over here. That is the French Huguenot Church. French Huguenots are French Protestants. France was a, was a Catholic country. They fled religious persecution. They came here to Charleston and they set up their congregation in 1681, not far behind the Anglicans of St. Philip's. This building is important as well to American history. Uh, and it is uh, the Dock Street Theater. Let's walk across the street and get a better view of it. So we're just passing Queen Street right here. But originally Queen Street was known as Dock Street because the parishioners to the Huguenot Church would actually come by boat and they would tie their boats up to the ends of the docks right near the church. Here across the street on the corner 
was the first building solely built for the purpose of theatrical performances in the United States. In 1736, uh, their, that was their opening night. So that building stood where these brick buildings are. Uh, there's some remnants of it uh, there as well. In 1809, a husband and wife bought this property and they started adding on these buildings and they made a hotel that they called the Planters Hotel. So if you have ever heard of Planters Punch, pretty good rum drink, uh, they're pretty sure that it originated here at the Planters Hotel. And this remained a hotel for a very long time. Uh, however, Charleston was not immune to the Great Depression and by the 1930s there were a lot of people out of work and it became a public works project to bring this back into being a colonial style theater again. They took information of colonial theaters all over uh, up and down the East Coast to recreate one here. And it is very impressive. Uh, it is open to the public, so let's sneak a little look inside while we get a chance. So I just wanted you to get a, a brief look uh, inside, and maybe the camera can just go up there for you guys to see. Uh, but they did recreate a colonial style theater here uh, in what was the courtyard of the original hotel is where you'll find all the pew seating down below. There's a beautiful stage. Uh, the back part of the stage would have been near where the buildings were for the original theater in the 1700s. Um, it's really impressive. Let's just take a quick look. A little reminiscent of Ford's Theater in DC, but it's a lot larger than that. Um, it's a really, really neat place. Um, the crest of King George III is over the stage because in the 1700s he required all public buildings to display his crest. Uh, and so in homage to the original theater that was here in the 1730s, they've recreated uh, the crest of King George and they put it up there uh, over the stage. There's also a beautiful room upstairs as well as original plaster work from homes that were destroyed, but for some reason they decided to keep all of the beautiful artistry. Uh, Charleston is known for our architecture and our beauty, and this is a great place to see it. Here is another just great room to see what we do to restore buildings here in the city. That's why you guys come and visit. And we'll talk more about that when I can take my mask off. But I just wanted you to get um, a look of the, of the room itself. All right, so when you come and visit, definitely come in here. They're open Monday through Friday, 9 to 5. It's a city-owned building, so it's a cool place to come. There's even a beautiful courtyard in the back that a lot of people don't know about, but it's a public space. So bring a picnic lunch and enjoy a fountain and a nice quiet spot. Uh, with actual tables, which is rare to find in Charleston too, to be honest. Uh, but we're walking just to the next block, which is known as Chalmers Street. Chalmers Street is a really unique and beautiful street, and we'll talk about it a little bit more. We're gonna make a left uh, to talk about a couple buildings first. So, you can see the street changes a little bit. It looks a little different. Uh, they're made of stones. The crazy thing is, we don't have stone in Charleston. No stone at all. So if you see stone, it has to come from somewhere else. What is really interesting too is with no stone, we have no stone buildings, except for that one. That little tiny pink building is known as the pink house, and it is made out of Bermuda stone. Bermuda stone has a naturally pink hue to it, so it has always been known as the pink house. Uh, it is also the oldest structure in the city of Charleston. The best we can date it, it dates to the late 1680s to the early 1690s. And it was actually a tavern back in the day. Uh, a pirate actually set it up and decided to stay here and said, hey, I'll open up a tavern. You know, pirates enjoy drinking. It very quickly became a brothel upstairs with 13 women at one point listing their permanent residence as the pink house, which is pretty cool. Um, and just down the street a little ways, is a really cool museum in the city that sometimes is also overlooked for reasons I'm not quite sure. It's called the Old Slave Mart Museum. Yes, Charleston was uh, at the belly of the slave trade in America. Uh, it is said that nearly half of all African slaves that came to our country came through Charleston, South Carolina. And they were sold on docks and out in the open until actually a political cartoon came out in the 1850s 
And after that, it became illegal to sell slaves outdoors. And you ended up with slave marts. One of the largest and first ones established was the Ryan Slave Mart, which was here on these lands here. Uh, he had several different buildings. And by 1859, another man came and bought it. And this was a firehouse. He had uh, the arched windows going, uh, arched stoneway, excuse me, going over, uh, put in some beams, put a cover over it, and it became an indoor slave mart. Today, it is a wonderful museum. The people in here are so knowledgeable. There's a lot of really great information about the atrocities of slavery here in Charleston, as well as the triumphs of some really amazing people. So while you're in town, please be sure uh, to check it out. But we're gonna head back up the street a little bit more. This is Chalmers Street, and it is made of stones. These are actual ballast stones. They came here as the ballasts in ships. Charleston became one of the absolute wealthiest colonies for Britain. And we did that by exporting a lot, uh, which meant that often ships that came here were not very full of cargo. And you can't really sail a ship over a, the high seas without some weight to it. You needed something for balance, you needed ballast. So they grabbed stones for whatever port that they were in and they used them as ballast in the ships and the bellies of the ships. When they came here to Charleston, they were here to load up with cargo. So they didn't need the stones anymore. They started offloading them and we got so many of them, we just started making streets out of them. There are very few ballast stone streets left in the city, uh, but Chalmers Street will always remain a ballast stone street. Uh, so when you're here, just know when you hear the term cobblestone, these are not cobblestones. Cobblestones are cobbled to fit together. They're much smaller. They really are ballast stones. They really are from uh, rivers in England, probably put here in the 16 and 1700s. Uh, we also had a lot of tabby streets back then too, oyster shells and, and dirt. Uh, but we're gonna kind of walk up Chalmers a little bit more. It's just a beautiful, beautiful street. And it's a great place to talk about why a lot of people come here to the city. Yes, we have a lot of history. We have beautiful architecture here. And that is due to the fact that we are the birthplace of preservation and restoration in the United States. Uh, by the 1920s, a lot of companies were coming in and tearing buildings down. They tore down a huge orphanage that was beautiful. They tore that, that down to make a Sears department store. They tore down at one point the wealthiest man in the South, his home. His name was Gabriel Manigo. To make matters worse, he became so wealthy because he was a prolific architect and he had designed his own home and they knocked it down. Then on top of that, what did they end up doing? They saved pieces of these homes and buildings that they had knocked down, including pieces from Gabriel Manigo's home. And just a little bit further up the street here on Chalmers and Meeting Street at the corner, you'll find the historic Charleston Foundation Museum shop. But if you look at it closely, you can picture that it was actually an Esso station. So they knocked down a historic, three historic homes that were on that site to build this gas station. And then to add insult to injury, they took the columns from Gabriel Manigo's home and they stuck them on the gas station building. And that was enough for one woman to put her foot down. And in 1920, she formed the first preservation society in the United States. And by 1931, she and two of her girlfriends had, <coughs> excuse me, established the first uh, historic district in the US as well as the first board of architectural review. So wherever you live, if your city needs to go through laws to have old buildings uh, restored or fixed or renovated in any way, uh, it's actually thanks to Charleston and our preservation efforts. So the building uh, that was the gas station is actually just one building up, but it is across from this absolutely beautiful park, which I thought maybe we could walk through so you can uh, see Charleston in full bloom in the spring. Just watch your step as you're walking around here. Clearly it's a gathering place. You'll hear children as we're walking by talking to people. But it's a really beautiful park with beautiful live oak trees. We call them live oaks because they're green all year round. Um, they have little tiny leaves, not like oak, leaves, uh, oak trees up north. Uh, there's always old growth being pushed out by new growth. So we get to rake all the time here. But uh, we do end up with beautiful flowers in here all the time. There's benches to sit. It's a shady spot to get out of uh, the sun every now and again. And there's a lot of different monuments and statues in here that you're welcome to come and read about while you're here. 
This building here that says it's a museum is actually the first fireproof building in the United States. It's all made out of brick and ironwork around the windows and doors, and it was designed by Charleston a native born architect who's also credited as being the first formally trained architect in America. His name was Robert Mills. He also helped design the Washington Monument in DC as well as several buildings in DC. Uh, but that's the first fireproof building made by him. And then on the other side, you just get a back view of a building we're going to really see in just a moment. Pretty important to Charleston history. But we did just exit the park onto Meeting Street. And just slightly north of Meeting Street is where we ended up having the boundary into our city. And this was the heart of the old walled city. In, 16, in the mid 1670s, when they started creating the walled city, and by 1680, when you moved here, this would have been an open park. That was part of the plan of the grand model, so to speak. And where this building is behind the camera at the moment, right here, this was where the original market was. It was a beef market. Uh, eventually, in the very early 1800s, it was converted and Gabriel Manigo designed this building. It became the city bank, uh, and the U.S. bank, excuse me. And by 1811, there was no more bank. It became our city hall. It has been our city hall ever since. And you are certainly welcome to go inside. It's a pretty cool looking place. Let's head across the street to get a better view of some of the other buildings here and to really uh, show you how you would have come into the city. If you take a look, there's a stone building here on my left-hand side, as well as a brick building. You'll be able to see where the stone building and the brick building, there's a space in between them. And that actually is approximately where the drawbridge was to enter the city. How cool is that? We had a drawbridge. Uh, and this faces the land. So I told you that we were completely surrounded by water. So what happened? When they created the walled city, the wall here was actually an earthenware wall made from mud and palmetto logs. Uh, so they actually dug a trench, used the mud from that to create a wall, and in the process created a natural moat. So we were surrounded by a moat and had a drawbridge. I think that's really cool. And when you came in through the, the city gate and the drawbridge, you would have been entered on, upon this big square where there's this beautiful white church right now. That is where the first church we saw, St. Philip's, the first congregation in the city, had their very first church building. It was a little wooden uh, structure. Again, in 1710 was when they started to build that other big church that we saw. Uh, and this white building is now the oldest church building in the city of Charleston. Uh, it was completed in 1761. Every single stained glass window in there is Lewis Comfort Tiffany. He made them. Uh, there's really amazing things inside and it is often usually open up to the public as well. So when you're in town, please come and see that. There is a stone building right here across from the church and across the street from where I am. That is our federal building. It houses the U.S. Post Office as well as the federal courthouse. Uh, so pretty important building as well. And then we're standing in front of a white building, which as we cross the street, we'll get a better look at it. This white building was at one point the State House of uh, South Carolina. And it has since become the county courthouse. It is the old county courthouse. There's a modern facility behind it as well but you can get a better look at it uh, from right here. And so now we have City Hall, the County Courthouse, the Federal Building, and St. Michael's Church. This corner is known as the Four Corners of Law. If you ask any local, where do, where's the Four Corners? They mean to come here to Meeting Street and Broad Street. They'll direct you right here. We've got City Law, County Law, Federal Law, and God's Law all in one place. So it's a pretty uh, important place in the city and something that's often talked about. So now we're going to uh, cross down uh, Meeting Street back onto Broad Street. On our left-hand side is City Hall as well as Washington Park. Broad Street, amazingly, the broadest street in the city. Again, they didn't think too hard for their street names here. Uh, but it is uh, filled with these slate sidewalks. Again, no stone here in the city. So where the heck did this come from? This all came from New England and was brought here in the, mainly the 1800s to be put down as the streets. But it's kind of remarkable when you think of all the people that would have been walking along these streets. Um, here in St. Philip's, there are two signers of our Constitution buried. Uh, Edward Rutledge was buried in St. Philip's. His brother John signed the Constitution, and he's buried here in St. Michael's. It's just a really pretty street to walk down. Broad Street, obviously, being the biggest street in the city from very early on, held a lot of different businesses. Uh, today it does too. It's not our retail 
a city by any means, part of the city, that would be King Street. Uh, but there were always booksellers here. Um, now there are a lot of attorneys, a lot of real estate businesses all along here as well. And the very end of the street is the old exchange building, which we'll be visiting later. Uh, but right up here at this street corner, uh, I'm sure we can get a good shot of what it looks like. Uh, it's considered the finest example of Palladian architecture in the United States. So Charleston really is important, not for our own history, but for American history. A lot of firsts happened here. There are a lot of really important buildings here. A lot of truly important people came here. Founding fathers came here. People lived here and worked here uh, that ended up making the laws for our country which I think is amazing. One of the reasons why I love living here. Um, I've been here 20 years and like to consider myself an honorary native. Uh, but we're gonna be coming up here. We're suddenly back at Church Street, okay? So hopefully we'll get a cute little view of, uh, or brief view ex at least, of the old exchange building if we can kind of stand in the middle of the street. Don't do that too much, don't get run over. Uh, but you can see the front of the building just to get a nice view of, of the old exchange building. And we'll definitely talk about it more uh, as we go on the tour a little bit further. So let's uh, keep walking down this way and we'll, we'll catch back up in front of the building. So we just walked up the street a little bit more. So we're a little bit closer to the old exchange building. Uh, like I said, it's the finest example of Palladian architecture in the United States. Uh, it was completed in 1771, and ancient Greek Palladio was known for his archways, which you will see lots of archways over the windows here, as well as we get the term palazzo from him, so he liked big open spaces. This is actually a very open plan building here in the city, which is not very common to find at all. Uh, a little tidbit is that there have been pirates uh, hosted down in the dungeon down there, uh, there's also the only place to see a remnant of the old wall is down in the dungeon of the old exchange building. On the second floor is a ballroom where George Washington, when he came and visited the city in 1791 on his tour of the southern states, he danced with over 300 ladies in that ballroom. Uh, he also enjoyed quite a few drinks down the street at McCready's Pub. Uh, but uh, Martha was not on his tour of the southern states. We're going to cross over right here. Uh, because just not far from the old exchange building is another place that everybody always wants to see when they come to Charleston. Uh, so we're just right by the old exchange. By the way, the old exchange building came right up and is made on Bay Street, which if you remember, was all water. So the water actually came 40 feet behind the building itself. Uh, by this time period, we were extremely wealthy and everybody wanted to show off their towns from the water. Uh, everybody could see that they had come to this big prosperous place. On top of that, they saw a lot of steeples. If you remember, I said that we were a place of religious freedom from the very beginning. Not only were there steeples and churches, we actually have a very uh, long history of Jewish history here. Uh, we had the second oldest synagogue building in our country here in downtown Charleston, not far from the market. And it is the absolute oldest continuous reform congregation in the United States. Uh, so we were known as the Holy City. When all of these ships came up into our city, they saw the old exchange building, so they saw all of these steeples, and they knew that they had finally reached Charleston. But here we are just down the street from the old exchange, and you see all of these beautiful pastel-colored buildings across the street. This is Rainbow Row, one of the most famous places in the city. And how the heck did we get Rainbow Row? Uh, it all kind of started with this street here. This is North Adger's Wharf. All the streets along here had the name Wharf in their names because that's what they were. The water did come up to here and eventually they filled it in with landfill and they created these wharves. These were the docks. What became Rainbow Row? These were all of the workmen's quarters. They had stores down below and counting houses down below for all of those goods. And then the people lived upstairs. In the 1930s, we would not be walking around here. Uh, again, during the Great Depression, we were pretty ratty and worn down. And this was a really seedy, yucky part of the city. But there was a lady in town who became South Carolina's first female real estate agent, a very enterprising woman indeed. She uses some of her earnings to buy herself a home here on East Bay. 
and she paints it pink for no other reason other than to brighten up this part of the city. And she gets all of her neighbors to follow suit. They all paint their homes different pastel colors, and we end up with Rainbow Row. So it's famous for being all different colors. It really should be famous for being the longest stretch of continuous colonial buildings in the United States. Uh, but as we come up just a little bit further to the street corner, we'll be at North Adger's, uh, sorry, South Adger's Wharf. Uh, he owned, had quite a few wharves in town, a very wealthy man, that Mr. Adger's, Captain Adger's. Uh, but here we are at South Adger's Wharf, and again, another Ballastone Street, but this has some brown bricks in it. They actually did an archaeological, archaeological dig here about a decade ago, and they found remnants of the old wall, and they put the pattern that they found it in. Right here would have been a place where we would have had guns, where we would have been able to turn our guns around in any direction to protect ourselves from any of those invaders. Uh, so really a cool place to be walking along where there would have been a wall. What happened to the whole wall? Simple. We became the place everybody wanted to come and live, and pretty soon we didn't need the walls. Uh, they were confining us when we really wanted to grow. So by the 1720s, 30s, and 40s, a lot of the wall was taken down. There were remnants still up in the 1780s. They eventually fell down. Uh, you know, the earthenware part was mud and palmetto logs, so that would have degraded over time. And again, the bricks also started to crumble, and then they weren't needed, so they took them down. Uh, right past the old exchange building in Rainbow Row is this cute little alley I'd love to take you down. It's called Longitude Lane. People never thought too hard, although I'm not quite sure it's on a longitude. We'll have to see. Uh, but what is Longitude Lane? It's an old tidal creek. Tidal creeks really played a part in Charleston's history and how we became so unbelievably wealthy. Again, the absolute wealthiest colony for Britain. We became so wealthy actually by growing rice. It was called Carolina gold rice because it really was our gold. There also was a golden hue to the husk of the rice. And one of the first people to help come and settle here, in fact, he's in the history books as the first Carolinian, at least the first European Carolinian anyway, his name was John Woodward. He originally comes here in 1666, uh, eventually is kidnapped by both, uh, by all three, an Indian, captain, uh, Indian chief, excuse me, Native American chief, as well as uh, the Spanish, who then imprisoned him in St. Augustine, and then a bunch of pirates. And then there's a shipwreck, and he ends up being picked up by the British and brought right here back to Charleston uh, in 1670. And without him, they would have never gotten this colony going since he knew all of the native tribes already. Uh, without him, they wouldn't have found where to settle. And he experimented with growing rice. He figured out, too, that with the brackish water that we have here in the rivers, the salt water will, will settle and the fresh water will be on top. And he helped try to figure out a way to get the fresh water with the tide to irrigate the rice paddy fields uh, with, for natural irrigation, uh, which really set us off and set the stage for growing all of this rice, which was then sent literally all over the world. The other crop that made us really wealthy was indigo, used to make the majestic blue and purple dye. In the 1740s, Eliza Lucas was a 17-year-old girl she ends up in charge of her father's three plantations, thanks to a couple of wars, including the War of Jenkins' Ear. Uh, and they end up sending her. Her father goes off to be a governor in the Caribbean, and he sends her a letter with indigo seeds in it and says, Honey, see if you can figure out what to do with these things. That girl figured it out, along with her boyfriend, Charles Pinckney. They figure out how to cultivate uh, indigo and to create it into the dye and it ends up being shipped to all of the British colonies. Uh, Eliza and Charles Pinckney do get married. Their son Charles Coatsworth Pinckney uh, ends up signing the U.S. Constitution and is buried here uh, in St. Michael's Churchyard. But we're back on Church Street, yet another church here in the Holy City. Uh, this is the first Baptist church, really the first Baptist church south of the, of the Virginia line. Uh, designed by Robert Mills, that native-born architect we talked about, and uh, the first trained, formally trained architect in North America. Right next to First Baptist uh, is a little place all of us locals love. Uh, it is 59 Church Street. Uh, it is said to be haunted by the whistling doctor. Uh, he was a man who was shot in a leg in a duel in Philadelphia Alley, again, also not far from the market. And he was brought back here to this tenement building where he ended up dying from the infection from his gunshot wound. 
He was known to whistle all around the city. They say sometimes they can hear him whistling in there. Uh, the children that have grown up there have said they've seen him checking in on them. Uh, so not a scary ghost, but said to haunt there nonetheless. Uh, the family who's in there now, whether they choose to sell or they meet their demise and are no longer owners of that home, the Historic Charleston Foundation will be taking it over for a museum. But we're walking down. It's such a beautiful, quiet street. It's one of the quietest places in the city. It's beautiful with all of these trees everywhere. And there's yet another alley we get to go down. This is called Stoll's Alley. Don't be afraid to walk and explore in the city. There's so many alleys to see. This is cool for me to show you, especially for the building behind us. It looks a little dilapidated, but it's a great place for you to see really what we could look like if we didn't have all those restoration efforts. And it also lets you see what buildings really are made out of. We don't have stone. So every single building in the city is either brick or wood. And back in the day, the English colonists were used to British row homes, stone row homes. They really didn't like the look of brick, but it would have been very expensive to import stone to make a home. So what they tended to do was cover their brick in stucco. And then if you look closely, you can see, see that it is scored to make it look like stone. So really, when you're walking around the city, keep that in mind. That's usually what most of the buildings look like. If you see a wood building like this one coming up, you can see the paint peeling off of it. You're wondering what's going on. This is wood most likely from the 1700s. All of the wood in the city that the homes were made out of was black cypress. Black cypress trees are the trees that grow in swamps. Their trunks are literally covered with water, which will tell you they could really care less about the humidity here, our flooding, everything that we get. Water does not rot them out. They're also very oily. That's why you'll see a lot of paint peeling off of people's homes. They have to repaint them every few years in the city. That oil, that resin, actually also keeps away wood boring animals like carpenter bees and carpenter ants. So the wood is just an excellent resource. Uh, and it was used so well, these homes were made so well that almost every house you see in the city that is made out of wood is black cypress from the, usually the 1700s, maybe the 1800s on some, but mainly the 1700s. Stoll's Alley has a lot of ironwork in it. We just passed a few gates. Uh, here's one right here. Every single gate that you find in Stoll's Alley was actually made by a very important man in Charleston history. His name is Philip Simmons. And Philip Simmons was born in 1912. As a young boy, he used to walk past a man's forge every single day. And every day, he would beg that man to teach him how to be a blacksmith. And every day, that man said, no. Uh, you are way too young. This is very hot and dangerous work. Absolutely not. Uh, but if you're begged every single day by a little kid, you will eventually relent and want to show them something. And by the age of 12, Philip Simmons becomes an apprentice blacksmith under this man. That man himself had actually learned the trade through his family line. His grandfather was an enslaved man who was a blacksmith. You have to think the slaves are the ones that built this beautiful city. They became amazing artisans and craftsmen, and they passed those trades down through their family line. Philip Simmons ends up learning that craft, and he grows to become one of the most decorated artists in the United States. He is awarded the American Heritage Foundation Medal, the top honor the U.S. gives to an American artist. And his works are everywhere. His works in the Smithsonian, but they're all over the city here. So I live in a living museum, and when you come here, please, please look at his artwork. It's beautiful. If you see hearts, chances are you're looking at a Philip Simmons gate. Not all the hearts are his, but he was definitely known for hearts. Upside down, sideways, doesn't really matter any, any little way. He did die in 2009, which means he was 97 years old when he finally passed away. He was such a jovial and friendly guy. He was mentoring people how to become blacksmiths pretty much up until the day of his death. Uh, his home was up for being demolished. They saved it. It is a national historic landmark, and you're welcome to go and visit it. Uh, he never wanted to leave the home where he had raised his children, and he never did. His forge is in the back of it. So if you're in town, look it up and uh, go and check it out. Stoll's Alley, though, as well as being this really quiet, beautiful neighborhood, is a great place to see kind of how big some of the houses could get here. We are now outside of the original wall. Most of the homes here uh, in this area was built around 1820 and later. But if you look from this drain pipe all the way down out to the street, this is one single family house. It's about 20,000 square feet. Uh, at one point, this building most likely was a stable house or a kitchen house. Uh, eventually, after the abolition of slavery, they connected these buildings together 
and it becomes one big single family home. 20,000 square feet. That's really big. Um, but it's a really cool, quiet alley to, to walk down. There's a little condo that they made down here. They don't rent it out uh, currently. Most of these are just single family homes, not rented to be condos or apartments. But it does have my favorite address in the city. Zero, Stoll's Alley. But it ends up leading out here onto East Battery. We're now going from East Bay Street. And right at this little dog leg, it turns to East Battery. The batteries is somewhere, is somewhere everybody always wants to come when they come to Charleston. They envision the waterway, these big, beautiful mansions. But we're going to talk a little bit about what the battery um, really is and talk about what we see out in that water. We're just going to cross the street here. There's a set of stairs right over here. Uh, just watch yourself as you cross the street. And uh, the stairs are kind of a weird height. So when you're visiting the city, make sure uh, you watch your step as you're going. So here we are just walking across the street up to the battery. You'll see that it is the slate promenade. In the 1800s is when they made it into this big slate walkway. Before then, this was a dirt rampart with a battery of cannons all along it. So that is how it gets its name. It was one of the main defense places for the city. And if you look out into the harbor, you'll see different land masses. To the left over there is a small little island with a flag you might be able to see. That is Castle Pinckney. When they originally wanted to move from Albemarle Point or Charlestown Landing to, up to here to the peninsula in 1680, they thought that they could use that as a fort. That wasn't the smartest idea. It's really close into land, so not exactly the best place for a fort. It was never really used as one. They end up using it as a place to, for prisoners of war uh, eventually, and now it's just one foundation changes the flag out there, so not much going on there anymore. But if you look out into the harbor, you'll see a radio tower. To the right of it is an island. That is Fort Sumter, where the first shots of the Civil War rang out. And to the left of the radio tower, there's some land that has a black stick coming up out of it. That black stick is the lighthouse out on Sullivan's Island. And on Sullivan's Island, you'll find Fort Moultrie. Fort Moultrie is really important to Charleston as well as American history. It is the site of the very first decisive victory of the Revolutionary War on June 28, 1776. Fort Moultrie became such a historic place and important out of kind of a bit of a folly. No one was ready for the British invasion, so they very quickly built a fort out there. And they had to use the materials that were out there on the island. And all that there was were palmetto trees, which are these palm trees you'll see around the city. They're really not palm trees. Go ask a botanist about that. But they are, look like palm trees, and they're very fibrous. Their trunks are nothing but fibers. And they end up using these palmetto trees to make the fort. They only have time to build three walls before the British start firing, so it's not even completed. But it is so spongy that the cannonballs from the British literally bounce off the walls and they protect our men, and our men are then able to defeat the British, which is pretty cool. At, very shortly after that victory, Colonel Moultrie ends up making our state flag, which you'll see everywhere if you come to visit. It's blue, it's got a palmetto tree, and what looks like a crescent moon. No one really knows what that is, because he only described it as a crescent, but literally historians still debate that today, what it is, whether it's a gorget, a protected breastplate, or if it's actually a crescent moon. Uh, but it became our state flag and our state tree. Fort Sumter, on the other hand, has the distinguished uh, spot of being the first shots of the Civil War. And that all happened because on December 20th of 1860, here in Charleston, South Carolina secedes from the Union. And in the early portion of 1861, talks were in the works about relinquishing all the area forts into Confederate hands. When seemingly out of nowhere, Colonel Anderson from the north moves his men from Sullivan's Island over to Fort Sumter. He actually did write a letter to state that he was going to be moving, and the reason why was because his men were dying out there and that a ship was going to come with supplies to help him, and that would be an easier place for him to catch that supply ship. We will never know what happened with that letter. Uh, it gave a certain time frame of when he would be moving so that the Confederates would be made aware. But something happened with that letter. There was a miscommunication. 
the Confederates end up firing on the Union troops on Fort Sumter on April 12th of 1861. And those are considered the first shots of the Civil War. Later on, we end up having 563 days of consecutive shelling in the city during the war. So all of these big, beautiful mansions were saved, thankfully, because they were so close to the water, but there was a lot of destruction in the city. And even the Confederates blew up their guns. They blew up a huge gun they had right here at the corner. And when they did, a 500 pound piece of that cannon flew into the attic of this house. And it's still in there. It's part of the structural support of the building. So you never really know what's above or below you in the city. They're constantly finding artifacts from the wall to uh, people's grave sites that they weren't aware were there to cannonballs in attics. You never know. It makes it an adventure in and of itself. But we're very close to the very end of East Battery Street. And right at the very end is an absolutely gorgeous park. It's a great place to catch some shade because we get pretty hot here in the city. Uh, there's beautiful live oaks, a promenade through the middle, a wonderful gazebo, and a lot more uh, mansions to admire. Uh, they're really, really pretty buildings, all single family residences. So I would love to live in one of them. <laughs> But we're just going to head over to the park and we'll walk through it a little bit and we're going to head up Meeting Street and talk a little bit about some other homes that we see and some important people too. We haven't gone very far. We just walked into the park itself just so you can get a really beautiful uh, view of how gorgeous this park is. There's these huge live oak trees everywhere. This park was really dedicated in the 1800s and that house over there is kind of interesting. It's known as the Villa Margarita, that white house with the columns. It sustained a lot of damage in Hurricane Hugo in 1989 and stood dilapidated for a really long time until it was finally uh, restored back to its former glory. But what else is really cool about it is that at one point on White Point Gardens, as this is known, there was a bathhouse here, a public bathhouse, and the Villa Margarita was a host of a lot of parties that would enjoy the bathhouse, and then they'd go over to the Villa Margarita where there was actually an indoor pool as well. So uh, a lot of debauchery going on and a lot of fun at the Villa Margarita. There is this gazebo here, as you can see, dedicated in April 1905. Uh, this is a great wedding spot. So uh, this is the place I was saying a lot of people like to get married for a pretty nominal fee compared to everywhere else in the city. And uh, we're going to walk through uh, this exit. We're going to end up on Meeting Street. A little uh, modern history in this thing. You'll see some people at the payphone over here. You don't see very many of those anymore. Uh, that is a working payphone. And this fountain is a statue in memory of uh, the Confederate soldiers and the Confederate Army. Local hint. It's potable water, so if you're thirsty, come and fill up your water bottle. Not a lot of people know that, but uh, you should take that hint. And then it will open up onto Meeting Street, and you see this really large brick home here. Uh, that was actually the Middleton Town Home. So one of our plantations here in the city up on the Ashley River is Middleton Plantation. Uh, it's a beautiful place to go, especially in the spring. Uh, right now, all of the azaleas are blooming. If you go there in late February, early March, you'll see all the camellias blooming, so really beautiful place to go. The Middletons were a very wealthy family, and this was their town home. These were, this was the house they came to just when they came to town to do business uh, or for the social season. You know, just a small place to hang out. Nothing big, nothing fancy. Uh, clearly an understatement. It's a pretty humongous house. Uh, but we're going to walk across here, and you'll see that there's a little uh, white house right here. It's kind of hard to see through the camellias and through the bushes, uh, but this is to Meeting Street Inn. Uh, it is a great place to stay. It's definitely a favorite for honeymooners. And it's also known as the Wedding Cake House because it kind of looks like an old school wedding cake. This home has a little bit of history to it too. The woman who got married and who lived in this home was the daughter of a very wealthy man here in town. And on the night of her wedding, it is said that he laid $75,000 under her satin pillow as her wedding gift for his daughter to have her dream home. Well, her groom's parents, not wanting to be outdone, then decided to gift them a wonderful European honeymoon. 
So they honeymooned in Europe for about a year while their beautiful Queen Anne Victorian style home was being built. On the day of their fifth anniversary, Daddy's very good friend gifted her an anniversary gift. You'll see if you go there, uh, on the op both sides of the front door are side light windows that were gifts by Louis Comfort Tiffany himself. Uh, so Daddy's friend Louie came and gave her some beautiful stained glass windows to put into her home. So absolutely beautiful. George Williams was a very wealthy guy. He was a smart man um, and he ends up, <coughs> excuse me, becoming very rich uh, after the Civil War. Uh, he's a blockade runner. He ended up doing a lot of business that way and he ends up building this absolutely humongous house. This is the largest home in Charleston. It is 24,000 square feet and it is still a single family residence. Uh, it is in an Italianate style of building. You can see those big bulbous spindles on the uh, balcony that we have here that we call a piazza. Uh, you'll see the beautiful moldings around the doors. You'll see the rope molding around the windows. Uh, he was a shipping merchant. Uh, a lot of moldings you'll see here on the big houses. You'll see rope everywhere. This also has rope all over it because at one point, uh, this was all painted battleship gray. This ended up being a, a Navy station and everything inside and out was painted battleship gray. You can actually see some of the gray on the second story window in the, around the black uh, paintings around there. So everything was painted that way. Uh, eventually, this ends up being known as the Calhoun Mansion. It really had nothing to do with John C. Calhoun. George Williams, son-in-law and daughter end up inheriting this home and his son-in-law was the second grandson of John C. Calhoun. Recognizing the Calhoun name was probably a little bit uh, more known than the Williams name. It ended up being known as the Calhoun Mansion for a very long time. But now if you look on the sign, they've changed it back to the Williams Mansion, obviously uh, more for uh, what has been happening in today's climate and, and uh, what we've been talking about a lot in today's history. So it's back to being known as the Williams home. Uh, inside this house, they did a lot of restoration. Obviously everything at one point was battleship gray, right? A man built this home, uh, sorry, bought this home and he spent 20 years restoring it. At one point in one room, they realized that one of the ceilings looked a little smaller and shorter than the others, which didn't seem to make much sense. They poked a little hole in it discovered that it was a false ceiling, took it down and discovered a hand stenciled ceiling by Lewis Comfort Tiffany underneath. Pretty impressive. Another impressive thing is the building across the street. It looks like stone, but it's actually wood carved to make it look like stone. So another very wealthy uh, person originally owned that home. George Williams ends up buying it. Uh, he ends up restoring some of it. He adds the uh, piazzas onto it. There's these huge cantilevered rounded out piazzas uh, that he ended up hosting uh, orphans on on Sundays for ice cream parties. That's why he said he wanted to put uh, those big, huge cantilevered things out. Uh, so really impressive homes right here, all thanks to George Williams. We're walking just a little bit further down Meeting Street and I just got a beautiful scent when you're walking around the city, you might smell something really sweet. It's kind of fleeting. It's actually tea olive. It's a, a tree or a bush. It has a little tiny white flower on it. Sometimes you can go right up to that flower. You can't smell anything. Other times you walk by and it's so fragrant. The jasmine is starting to bloom right now as well. Uh, just across the street here, that home always has tremendous window boxes. They'll end up growing all the way down to the sidewalk. Um, so. Just one of the charms here in the city when you're walking around, especially here in the springtime, everything is in bloom right now and it's absolutely beautiful. This house right here is actually a really good example of the typical architecture that you'll find in the city. So let me just get to a spot where you might be able to see it a little bit better. We might have to go across the street a little bit to get a good view. So this home here is a pretty good example of some of the architecture that you'll see a lot of in the city. We call it a Charleston single house and it's for the simple reason uh, that it's a single 
room wide. When you look at it from the street, it's just one room wide. It's actually two rooms deep. <laughs> so it's a single room wide, it's two rooms deep, and they're usually about three to three and a half stories tall. Very early on, uh, there was a law that said you could not build a building taller than the tallest church steeple. So if you're walking around here wondering why there are no skyscrapers, uh, that's why. Most buildings are around three and a half stories tall. And typically, the third story windows are shorter than the first and second story windows. It's kind of meant so that when you look up, you kind of feel like the building is, might be a little bit taller than it actually is. Uh, so it's meant to be a, an optical illusion. On the side of it, these are all facing south, sorry, all facing west, yes. Uh, all of the piazzas in the city face either south or west. That's to capture the breezes. I'm sure you'll see my hair blowing in the wind. You might hear some wind in my microphone. Uh, there's always a sea breeze here and they needed that. They didn't have air conditioning. It gets really hot here. We get heat indices, you know, in the triple digits. So they would be able to open their windows and doors and allow the air to circulate throughout their homes. So they did a lot of living out on what we call a piazza. You never tell a Charlestonian they have a nice porch. You tell them they have a lovely piazza. Below that piazza, you'll see a front door. That's actually the false front door. Uh, and if it was open, it meant that, yes, we are accepting visitors. Please come inside. When you go in that front door, you go past this first room on the first floor in the center of the home on the piazza is where you will find the front door. This is Georgian architecture centered on symmetry. So you come in the front door, there's a room to your left, a room to your right, a staircase in front of you, you go upstairs, a room to your left and a room to your right. So very typical architecture here uh, in the city and something I really wanted to make sure that uh, you were aware of as we're walking around. We're gonna be uh, heading up to a really beautiful house museum in the city. We actually have six house museums in the city uh, there are a couple of them that do reciprocity. The one that we're going to go and see is called the Nathaniel Russell House, uh, and it does reciprocity uh, with the Aiken Rhett House. So um, if you go to one, you can get a discount on the ticket of the other if you'd like. It's a pretty cool place. Uh, oh, we just passed something cool that you'll see all over the place. There are all these stones on the sidewalk. Some are not as elaborate as this one. Some is just a block of stone. Well. It's a carriage stone. It helps you get up into your horse and carriage. Uh, from the laws that we put into place for restoration and preservation in the city in the 1930s, uh, you may not destroy anything in the city 75 years or older from this present date. You can only restore it. And if there's nothing wrong with it, don't do anything to it. Uh, so the carriage stones, they're just a hunk of granite or marble just sitting there or brownstone. There's nothing wrong with them. Keep them where they are. Uh, so they're all over the place here. So as you're walking around, uh, be sure not to trip. It's pretty easy to do in the city between all of our uh, slate streets and ballastone streets and all of these. This house is pretty neat. It has a lot of ironwork on it. Every single piece of ironwork you see was done by Philip Simmons. And you can see uh, his well-known hearts here in this heart gate. Uh, so really beautiful. It's, his work is absolutely everywhere and we are just about to get to the gates to the Nathaniel Russell House, a tremendous house museum here in the city, and I really think you should check it out, if anything, because it's just a totally different architecture than all of the other architecture in the city. Uh, he was a very wealthy merchant. He decided to start to build this home uh, around between 1808 to 1811, excuse me, he was a shipping merchant with the East India Company, and he would do business in London. And so he went over to England, and he started to see the works of these two brothers, the Adams brothers, and he really liked what they were doing. They were getting away from Georgian architecture and started to change things. Georgian architecture was that symmetry with closed off rooms, a room to your left, a room to your right. They didn't really like that all that much. So he starts building this home. He keeps it in brick which was pretty remarkable because most people who had some money liked to cover it in stucco and score it to make it look like stone. He liked the brick. It was also said he was bragging in brick. He stylized the mortar between his bricks so it had a nice point in it. Uh, but you'll see his monogram up on that second story balcony right by this beautiful door. And as we're looking at it this way, it doesn't look that much different than most of the other architecture in the city until you start to walk. And then you'll see it starts to bump out. And all of a sudden you have this bay coming out of here. The Adams brothers really did something different. They didn't like all these little square rooms. So they made a square room, a rectangular room, and an oval room 
on every single floor. So it made it really interesting. On top of that, sure, people want to close things off. So every room has doors. Even the curved rooms have curved doors that will curve and see, go pocket seamlessly into the wall. So if you want to, you can have a totally open floor plan, which was pretty cool. Uh, his daughter, he, he built these homes, uh, this home, excuse me, when both of his daughters were uh, getting to be of age to be married off. And one of his daughters did get married in here. Upstairs in the second story here is their music room. She was married up there. And that's actually a functional balcony. Uh, there was no tax on windows, but there were taxes on exterior doors. So you'll find a lot of balconies in the city that are accessible through second or uh, double or triple story, uh, sorry, triple hung windows. So you can open those up and just walk right out uh, into there. But she was married up there, which is really neat. And the grounds here are beautiful. You are always welcome to come into the garden here. It's kind of Charleston's free a botanical garden. Here are some beautiful camellias still in bloom, which is kind of rare. It's they're about to be done, uh, but it's absolutely beautiful in here. It smells gorgeous in here. They have a, a lot of identifiers so you can learn what your plants are. They have a lot of information about the home itself uh, and the rustles themselves. So definitely come in and take a look. We're just going to walk a little bit just so I can show you another typical thing about the architecture that happened here in the city. Now the Russells have a large lot. They were very wealthy. They bought a double lot. Every home that people wanted to start to live here full time, not just as their town home, they had a work yard. Um, they had cows and chickens and goats. They were urban plantations in a sense, and you didn't want all of that near your house. And if you were wealthy, you might as well get a double lot. Uh, so we know Mrs. Russell had a beautiful rose garden. She had a beautiful garden. So they honored that here uh, during restoration process. And then back here would have been the work yard. There were slave quarters here that came down uh, in our massive earthquake that we had in 1886, 7.3 or so on today's Richter scale, they believed. Uh, so there were some male uh, slave quarters here as well as a work yard. And then this building here was the kitchen house. Uh, so this is the original kitchen house. And there would have been, a, a when you come in, a room to your right, a room to your left, and a hearth in both of those rooms, one for the laundry and one for cooking upstairs was where the female slaves lived. Those fires were burning 24 hours a day, every day of the year. Again, we get into the triple digits uh, here in the summer, so I can only imagine how terrible that was to, to live in those conditions. But as time went on and the abolition of slavery happens, this is something that happens a lot in the city. The kitchen homes, there was a law that they had to be at least 15 feet away from the actual dwelling because of the risk of fire. And after the abolition of slavery, people didn't need the kitchen houses to be separate anymore. They weren't used as kitchen homes anymore. They were used for extra space. And so they made a connection in the middle, which is called a hyphen. Same thing you use in a sentence, right? Uh, so they used a hyphen to connect the original building to the kitchen house. At one point, uh, this was a school for girls and they put extra bedrooms up there. Uh, but it's a really cool house museum. You're welcome to go inside. Again, you're always welcome to come into the gardens at any time you want for free. They also have a little gift shop in there as part of the Historical Charleston Foundation, which also has uh, a larger store on Meeting Street. Uh, so you can go in there too. Place for really beautiful items from Charleston. You can get uh, quilts, you can get furniture, uh, and then you can get little tasty items, uh, something we're known for, Benny wafers. They're these little sesame seed wafers. They're really delicious. They kind of taste like corn pops to me, but they're really good. Uh, but you can get things like that in the store, and you can get that here too. Uh, if you're walking around and you get thirsty, hint, hint, you can buy some water in there uh, without having to take a tour of the house if you don't want to. But I really hope you do. There's a three-story free-flying staircase uh, that goes from the bottom floor all the way up to the top without a single nail in it. It's all done in a cantilever system with just some wooden pegs. So really cool feat of engineering uh, to check out while you're here. This is the time of year you'll see a lot of wisteria. Uh, it blooms very fleetingly, uh, but it's beautiful when it does. And that's another example of a single home. The piazzas slope to allow for rainwater runoff, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then we're just here by another church, First Scots Presbyterian Church, and we're just one block away from St. Michael's and the Four Corners of Law. So we've really done a whole loop of the city. Uh, we touched on really just a brief 
little snippet of the history of the city. So please come here and visit. Uh, take a tour with myself, my coworker Scott, and any other uh, people we have out here working for free tours by foot. We do tours all over the country and all over the world. We all work for your tips. Uh, so we don't make any money from the company itself. It's really from patrons like you. So if you appreciated the tour today, I would really appreciate it if you used one of the links below to, to send me a little money my way and maybe also comment a nice comment. I would like that too. And I really hope you enjoyed it. My name is Diana, and thanks for joining us here in Charleston. Yeah.